Welcome to another edition of At Home with the President, I'm Anita Hebern. We're always pleased that you join us for these editions. They're quite exciting and we're always quite happy that the President invites us to his home to have a quick sit down with him. This week we're talking about crime and I know that is something that we've all been consumed with over the past couple of days. So Mr. President, again, thank you for inviting us to your home. Thank you, thank you for being here. You must have had a busy, busy couple of days with this issue of crime coming up. Yes, it is. It has been quite hectic. All right, let's get, to, let's get to the serious bit about crime because this is, this is a really serious issue in Guyana. Recently in the media, a survey conducted by the Latin American Public Opinion um, Project found that Guyana has the lowest level of trust in the police in the region and that trust continues to decrease over time. What do you think can be done to reverse the public's distrust of our police? Well, let me first of all say that I've read the re report and that in particular I found really unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Earlier today I spoke with the police officers at their conference and I was very explicit on this matter to say how much I am disappointed and, how, and, and, it, and I said very frankly it's not acceptable to me nor, it, nor is it acceptable to the Guyanese people and I expect it will not be acceptable to the leadership of the police force. And therefore, we have to ensure that we work on these issues to build back the trust uh, that, that of the Guyana police force with the population. I would say this, though, that the, the police, they have, the police, they have started already to do some of that work in the communities. You know, they had some work done in All Boys Town. They had some work done in Agricola. They, mm. And then they're now spreading out some of that type of work in other areas. And that I think is beginning to pay off for them because they're winning more and more support in the community. And that is extremely important. And I've encouraged them to continue on that aspect of their work. We have also been um, talking to them about their, their response time that they have when they're called in by citizens. And I am putting it to them that we have to ensure that they have a proper response time at the shortest possible time from the time a call is made to them mm -hmm. to their arrival on the scene must be very, very short and, and as short as possible in, in that regard. Another issue of complaint that the citizens have been complaining about is the, is the whole issue of their um, 911 system not working. And that has to be fixed even if we have to go to some special arrangements to get them fixed so that every time a phone call is made is answered and action is taken. So we're looking at putting in the systems to ensure even if it means that I have to outsource this, I'm ready to do that because this is extremely important for the police force to, be, to ensure that all calls are answered and that they act, they respond to some of these issues that citizens have been complaining about, rightfully so. So I think with the general work that the police is doing and the, um, the resources that we're putting into the police force at this time, together with the system that I'm speaking to you about improving the time of um, the reaction time, quick reaction time and so forth, I believe that those will help considerably in helping to restore confidence in, in the police. Um, generally. Now, you just, you just talked about the work you're doing in, community, in the communities, and I know that your government has spent a lot of resources and time investing in community policing groups. Mm -hmm. However, there, there have been some unsettling reports as well that members of the community policing groups are using, using their own leverage um, for individual agendas. Is this something that you find troubling as well? Well, let me, before I answer, go directly to answer you, let me say that in generally the Community policing groups have been doing a good job in, gener in a general sense. And they have been really complementing the work of the police force in that regard. But it is also true that I have been having some of the complaints that you mentioned just now. And I must say that that too is unacceptable. And we cannot allow, no one should use their positions in the police or in the community policing group to leverage anything. Mm -hmm. they, are, they must not ever forget that their, their main task is to serve, to give a service to the Guyanese people, 
It is vital that they understand it. And for the community producing group, it's even more important because they are the first contact. They are the first contact with the community, with the people in the community, the different groups, the teachers, the age groups. And it is important for them to have the highest level of confidence, and the people must have a lot of confidence in them, so that one, they will report, two, that they can have intelligence, information of what is going on, and generally, three, to help generally in the upliftment of the policing and the security in the various areas. I want also to emphasize the point to the police in particular and, and uh, generally the public that we see the work of the, of the police as very, very important to the general development of our society. Security is extremely important. Uh, people want to work. People want to carry on their businesses. People want to go about their leisure. But with a feeling that they are secured in what they're doing. That way, that will help production and productivity. It will attract more people to our country. And I, I believe it is, it is vital for us to ensure that the police builds that confidence and the, and the public get that confidence again in the police. Mm -hmm. um, the, to make the police very, very respectable in every community. That being said, I think also a lot has the police got to be conscious of that. That is what I hope this conference that they're having now will emphasize. That the leadership must be confident of that. And the leadership of the police force will have to do more supervision of the ranks and even and the community policing groups themselves to see that they're discharging the functions the way it is intended to be discharged and to understand and to be there with the ranks um, and I have a good understanding of, of, of what is taking place within the various communities. To use science and technology as far as possible in the fight against crime and in, in the detection and fight against crime at, at all levels. These are some of the things that, um, that we have to do. Another point probably I missed just now in speaking about building back the confidence in the police force. I had. Um, and I mentioned today again in my speech to the police, is the question of solving of crime. I even urge them today that they should open back all unsolved crimes. Go to f the criminals must not feel that they can get away with their criminal activities. If they feel that way, then they will continue to want to mm -hmm. live a life of, in crime. But if they know that they will be caught, and if they know that they will be caught quickly, that also will serve as a deterrent from, uh, from people to commit crimes within our society. So those are some of the areas I think we, we have to work hard on with the police force to ensure that they, they conduct themselves in such a way that the, the individual responsibility of officers of the force, that they must conduct themselves in such a way and they command respect not only of their men or, or their colleagues in the force, but that they command the respect of the community, that they should be fair and firm um, in, in the discharge of their duty. And in that way, I think they can relink within the communities and build strong community policing relationship that will develop the trust that is needed at this point in time. All of what you said there does include a, a lot, an awful lot of allocating additional resources um, to address the crime situation in Guyana. Um, how can you uh, reassure the people of Guyana that these resources that you will be um, putting and investing in the Guyana Police Service, that it actually is going to be used as it is intended to? Well, it is already being seen. On the capital side, we have built a new forensic lab. Mm -hmm. That is what I mentioned, just, I mean, using science and technology in the fight against crime so that evidence can not only be uh, based on um, one person's word against another person's word, but you can have scientific evidence to present in court now. Mm -hmm. We have also to fight against piracy, which is an issue that fishermen complain about a lot. Police got a floating base. But not only the police, but we have created what is called the joint services so that they can share resources with each other. We have pumped in a lot of resources in the police and in the army in particular, 
and they can share resources. The, the army also got many base, floating bases in some of the rivers on, on, on the coastal front, on the coastal front, where they can fight some of these criminal activities. We have invested in training. A lot of money has been invested in training our policemen. We have created a new SWAT team. Um, they are now ready. They are very well trained, highly trained men that they are ready now to go into action to fight against serious types of crimes. Mm -hmm. We have, in every way, in vehicles, we have invested a lot in vehicles. We, we have invested in modern communication systems to try to help with the response time and to move, move very quickly um, to defend and to, to fight the, criminal, the, criminal, the crimes in our country. So yes, I would say that we have, uh, the evidence is there for all to see how much we have put in. We have, with the Army and this, the Army um, as the part of the Joint Services, willing to share with the police. They have an air wing, so if you need to move, move police very quickly to some areas, mm -hmm. the Army is ready to, to work and cooperate with them. We have new boats, fast boats, to fight against pirates, but also to move from one part of the country to another where we have to, where the waterways would be the fastest way to go. So the, the government has put in a lot of, lot of resources. And, and added to that, I must say that we have had very, very good cooperation with the international community and the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, other countries in the region, governments in the region. So we have done all of these things and we have um, putting, we have created new units to fight drugs like Kanu. Mm -hmm. We have now a new unit to fight mo money laundering, uh, which will hopefully catch the illicit money or the criminal money made by international criminals. And that I think will have a big dent on crime as a whole. So, you, you, so you're satisfied that the resources you're investing in the police force Ghana police service that there is being adequately used? Yes, I think it, some of it could be better because um, my understanding is that the, the, the life expectancy of vehicles are sometimes pretty short in these, in these forces. But the main thing is that we have been putting our resources, we have been putting the money, and we have been resourcing the, the security forces in our country so that they can discharge their constitutional function in a proper way. When we, when we talk about crime in Ghana, we started off from the, 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 the premise that uh, Guyanese don't have a lot of trust in the, in the Ghana Police Service. What do, you, do you think there's a particular issue in the Ghana Police Service that we need that, that's perhaps more important to address so that um, the public trust in the, in, in the service can be, can be um, reaffirmed? Well, my first reaction to that, I suspect that you're probably angling to talk about that. Um, wages and salaries and so forth. Um, I would say that over the years we have also, we have also improved considerably, but I will be the first to say that the, the police officers probably deserve more. And we may, maybe have to look at some special system, more incentive schemes and so forth for the police to, um, to, to deal with some of these issues as far as allocation of scarce resources are concerned. But I think also it is very important for the police officers themselves to have a greater appreciation of their role in the society mm -hmm. how it, and the importance that they play in the development of the society and the contribution they can make to national development or they have to make the national development if our country is to continue in its upward trajectory that, we, that we've had. So I would say that to me that is probably primary Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I'm always open to searching for new ways to, to create incentives so that the police, police officers can discharge their, 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 their duties more effectively and more, more efficiently. The other area that I spoke to the police about um, is the perception that the rich people get away with things that ordinary people can't get away with. For me, the crimes, any crime, the, the law and the application of the law must be blind. It should not have, that should not have any, any consequences. And I have been having a lot, of, a lot of complaints about noise nuisance. People with businesses that they don't have the proper sound protection and they disturb neighbors. 
um, from their sleep. And I'm not, I'm not speaking here about wedding house when once in a while, not every day you have a wedding mm -hmm. and, um, and you have something of that nature. But I'm speaking of people who have shops or nightclubs that constantly interrupt people, people's lives. And if many people feel that the police do not act on these things. I spoke to the police about that, that that cannot be, that cannot be continued. They have been pointing out to me that some legislation needs to be changed. So hopefully, in that regard, like, be, because they said to me that they, they can only discharge some of these people. But because right now fines and so forth are so low mm -hmm. that some of these people just pay the fines and continue doing the same thing because the fines are not a deterrent. So they think that they have to be some kind of parliamentary intervention. So one of the top priorities I will have when we win back the majority in the National Assembly is to ensure that those are reviewed mm -hmm. and, and to strengthen so that we can in, discourage people from breaking the laws uh, as they seem to want to do it at will. Mr. President, in light of the recent gunning down of Mr. Courtney Crummy Wing, there has been a tremendous amount of speculation, blame placing, and the usual paranoia that surrounds um, these sorts of killings. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, let me say and express my own deep sympathy to the family of Mr. Kami Ring for what has happened. That is the thing that we're fighting against. Those are the type of things that we have been fighting against and fighting to avoid these things from happening. So I want to really extend my deepest sympathy to the family on his, his passing. And I said also to the police that I want no stone left unturned for them to investigate and find the, the killer of Mr. Kamiwing. And if there are others behind the killing, if there are intellectual authors behind this killing, then they should go for those intellectual authors of this crime as well. Just to mention to you that, that as far as the government is concerned and as far as the PPP is concerned, Mr. Kamiwing was absolutely no threat, absolutely no threat to the government or to the, or to the PPP. And therefore, we have absolutely nothing to gain by Mr. Kami Wing's um, death. I've just, I just saw, though, like, like some politicians descending on these things and making serious statements. I saw one um, Dr. Hines, David Hines, is talking about there should be no reprisals. And I saw someone told me uh, that they saw a Facebook posting by Mr. Nigel Hughes that this is the first political assassination of the season. That's what I heard, that's what I was told is on his Facebook. Now, if they have information to say that this is a political act, then they should go to the police and give them all the information. If they don't have any evidence, then I, I will, that, what the, those statements could be interpreted as instigation, instigating people to violence in, in these activities. And, and therefore, I think that the police got to investigate every aspect, every aspect of, of this, of what took place there, to ensure that justice, that Mr. Com justice is done for Mr. Crummy Wing and his family. I insist that they must leave no stone unturned and they must work very, very hard to find out the killer or killers, and also if they are intellectual authors behind this act. So again, as I said, it should not be played with. These things should not be played with and should not be tried to be using for narrow political ends. And they, it, everything must be based on facts. So if they're making statements, it must be based on facts and let them go and report to the police. All right. Well, it sounds as though you're moving towards a zero, zero tolerance on, on, on crime in Guyana. This zero tolerance policy is, of course, something that we've been hearing a lot about um, when it comes to crime. Do you think, what exactly is the zero tolerance policy? Well, the zero tolerance policy is just what it says, to have no tolerance to people committing crimes. But it also is linked with um, environment. It's linked with the so-called broken window theory 
the, the theory which more or less says that if a window is broken, it can attract more bricks to that window than if you have a, a full, full window with all the panes mm -hmm. in place. And therefore, if you have a broken window, you should fix it as fast as, as possible. So it has been proven to work. I think that was one of the measures that was used in New York. Uh, and they, it has proven to work to, to look at all kinds of crime. And by dealing with small crimes and big crimes and dealing with them effectively, it has served as a, a big deterrence to those who um, want to go and live a life of crime. So that is where I think we have, we have to focus uh, to, to carry the fight to have no tolerance and no kinds of crime, whether they're big or, or whether they're small, as long as they're breaking the law, they must feel the consequences of those laws. So that is what the zero tolerance is. To, as I said, what, exactly what it says, that have no tolerance to people who are breaking the laws. Like, like I spoke earlier about the noise, people in noise nuisance, mm -hmm. people who do illegal vending, people who some you know, different types of illegal activity that the state must have a zero stop tolerance to these, these activities and deal with them time, in a timely fashion and deal with them condignly. Do you think, though, there shouldn't be any exceptions, the exceptions at all? If we use the case of someone who, um, when it comes to the zero tolerance uh, policy, do you think there should be exceptions sometimes that you should perhaps be a little bit more well, tolerant? I, I just said that the law should apply to everyone mm -hmm. and it should be, be applied across the board. And once the law is broken, that the police should take action. I, I don't know if you want to point to me of any type of condition where they should have exceptions. I don't think they should. Because the moment you start to introduce, um, you introduce these type of actions to make exceptions and so forth, then you will go from one and make exceptions for another, and you go back into the same rut. Therefore, zero tolerance must mean what it says: zero tolerance to breaking the law. And that is what you'd like the police service to do. That is what on. I would like to see the police do. Okay. We're coming down to the end of our program, and I, I know we talked a lot about reforms, and you mentioned some of those reforms. You want to see an improvement in, um, you want more resources allocated, you want to see the 911 system working better, you want to ensure that the communi community policing groups are functioning as they should. But I just wanted to ask you, um, since you mentioned those reforms that you want to implement um, towards you know, reducing crime, are there any others maybe as we're coming down to the end of the program that you'd like to perhaps add to that list? Well, some of them we spoke about just now. Mm -hmm. We spoke about the call, the 911 mm -hmm. function, that that has to be fixed. That to me is a big priority that we got to fix and fix as fast as possible. Um, we talked about, uh, about sourcing. We, we, I, I mentioned to you how much resources we have put into the, uh, into use the science to deal with these issues. And many other issues that we have um, dealt with to, to giving the police more, um, more equipment mm -hmm. to carry out their activity. But also to introduce things like um, under, undercover operations where they probably would be, would be um, patrolling with unmarked vehicles in, in plain clothes so that you can use the element of surprise to mm -hmm. catch criminal activities, criminal actions, um, moving around the different parts, using the science that exists nowadays with computer science and everything to map areas where you have frequency, the more the higher frequency of crime and criminal activity. Or also the, you might detect where you have at certain time in the day or night where you have an increase in crime so that the police can have some focused attention into these areas in, in dealing with these, with these information that they would have picked up and worked out and looking at patterns and developments um, in, in so forth. And of course, the whole question of building confidence with the community is vital because the community itself is the best source of information that the police can have and they, we, 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 we've been talking a long time about intelligence-guided 
police work. Mm -hmm. And that can only be possible with a strong link with the police and the community. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm very hopeful because I know that the police have started that kind of work with some of the social programs that they have in places like All Boys Town, Agricola, and other parts of the, um, the, the country mm -hmm. to try to engage with the population, work with them. And I think then that, that trust will build and in, they can have much, much more information to solve crimes within the various communities. Well, Mr. President, thank you again for inviting us to your home. Certainly it was an insightful, an insightful discussion with you, and we're looking forward to our next time visiting. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So that's our program for this week at Home with the President, I'm Anita Huburn. On behalf of the production crew, we'll see you next time. So long now. Mm -hmm.